Ruthless hunters, natural born killers, constantly on the prowl for new prey. These are the predators. These killing machines are the rulers of the savannah. And yet, although they perform their violent acts every day, they take no pleasure in killing. Rather, it's to survive. For them, as for their prey, life is a daily challenge. In the African savanna, right at the top of the food chain, are many species of big predators. Among them, the crocodile. The only survivor of the dinosaur era, a crocodile can be virtually invisible to its prey. He will lie in wait, submerged, motionless, even for hours. Fearsome, discreet, wily, he is perfectly adapted to life in the water and has the sinister reputation as the most dangerous killer in Africa. Predators have an essential part to play in the functioning of their ecosystems. By congregating at places where their prey can cause pollution, they limit proliferation, sparing other species that are few in number. Predators as a group, in limiting populations, help to preserve species that might otherwise eliminate one another. In the end, nature is well managed, because any given area always has just the number of predators it can handle, and no more. Each predator has its own way of hunting. Their strength and speed seem to protect them from many dangers, but their never-ending need for food, for survival, drives them constantly to keep hunting. Even when prey is abundant, chances of success are never sure. Often it depends on the strategy of the attack. Seized at the throat, this gnu has no chance. The lioness's jaws have broken its spine. The lioness can't lift her prey out of the water because the creek became too muddy during the dry season. She has to devour the animal here where it was killed. A rare practice. Usually several lionesses hunt together, but there are occasions of solo hunting. And then the lioness can rely only on herself to defend her kill. The prey has barely been taken when other predators start pointing their snouts toward the meal. Yes, it is not enough to hunt down and kill your prey. You have to defend it, too. The fury of a lioness can be fatal for a hyena. The sudden appearance of a buffalo might improve the hyena's chances. But is the big animal a real danger for the lioness? The buffalo keeps approaching, trying to frighten the lioness away from her kill. The herbivorous avenger forces the lioness to flee up a tree. High up in the acacia tree, she keeps a needle-sharp watch on what is happening below. Finally, the buffalo lets the lioness come down and the hyena sees his chance evaporating. In fact, the hyena gives up. The lioness could return to the dead prey at any moment to finish her meal. No, the hyena would rather try elsewhere, where a family of cheetahs is hunting in the area. At one point, the contest threatens to become fierce unless the hyena is content to be a little patient. Why not let the fastest predator of the savanna do all the hard work?
The female cheetah hunts alone because she can't count on her progeny. In this case, three teenagers. They're too young and too clumsy. Her hunting technique is simple. Just race to the prey as fast as possible and deliver a powerful swipe of the paw to throw the animal off balance. Once it's on the ground, the cheetah's powerful jaws sink teeth into the throat, and that's that. Once she sets off, there's no turning back. There is no room for error. Yes, this may be the fastest animal on Earth, reaching speeds of 100 kilometers per hour. That's 60 miles per hour. A gifted sprinter. But she soon runs out of breath and finds it hard to take the turns at high speed. She expends so much energy all at once that she needs a breathing space to recover. And these are precious minutes. Because the hyena is on the prowl and he knows that this is the instant to try something if he's going to steal any of the meat. The young cheetahs waste no time in munching off the first bits. The cheetah senses danger. But what can she do? These kids are too clumsy to make any sort of organized resistance. Their mother tries to put up a half-hearted bluff, but she knows that she and her offspring can't do anything against the hyena's terrible jaws and teeth, especially now with the smell of blood in the air. She doesn't even try to fight. Her big meal is not for today. She's a spent force, and she knows it. <laughs> the scent of blood draws many scavengers. They're not considered true predators because they eat animals that have already been killed by others. A real predator hunts down and kills live, fleeing animals. As for the hyena, his patience has paid off, and he can eat to his heart's content. And that is apt to be a quarter of his weight, nearly 20 kilograms, 40 pounds of fresh meat. Of course, the vultures might invite themselves to take some of it. A jackal is prowling around, but he's no match for the hyena. He, in turn, will find his meal someplace else, since the vultures uh, don't seem to be in a sharing mood, not even to give a morsel. So he has to fall back on more modest prey. Lichens, or wild dogs, are also considered prodigious predators in the savanna, the equals of cheetahs and even lions. They're among the carnivorous animals that hunt during the day. To feed the family twice every day at sunup and sundown, they leave their lairs to hunt in packs. But they're not always successful, because they're often smaller than the animals they attack. These creatures are classified between the dog and the hyena, and they're sometimes called hyena dogs. They drink very little, and their prey can be antelope, zebras, gazelles, and gnus. 
They're about the size of a big dog, but they're considered, perhaps, the most effective killing machine in the animal kingdom. They hunt in packs, like wolves. Alone, one could never take down a Thompson gazelle or a young Ganu. So it's vital that they hunt in packs, and this requires a well-planned division of labor. First stage, sneak up on a herd to spot one that is young or weak. Next, chasing down in relays. They charge the herd to scatter it and isolate the victim. And when that one starts to flee, the wild dog at the head of the pack takes after it at speeds of 50 kilometers an hour, 30 miles per hour. Their strength is in their numbers. The chief directs the whole procedure, but actually getting the prey is seldom as easy as it first appears. They succeed in two out of three hunts. Zebras know how to defend themselves. Their hooves are hard horn and they can use them effectively as powerful weapons against attacking predators. This time, the zebra herd manages to fight off this pack that isn't really prepared for this morning chase. Herbivorous animals know how to put up a good defense. Elephants stand very tall, and they fear none. But the others have to learn the behavior patterns of their potential predators. They know when they're hunting and when they're not. So, it's common to see a herd of zebras calmly munching plants just a few feet from a relaxing lioness. But the zebras are watchful all the same. The stallion stands slightly apart like a sentinel. When he senses danger, he alerts the others with a whinny. Instantly, they all form a group and they flee together. With the stallion bringing up the rear, where he can nip the legs of the slow zebras to make them keep up with the others. But the greatest danger for all of them is crossing a river. Because it's there that crocodiles lie in wait. And if crocodiles are seen as the most frightening predators on the planet, it's because they're not only clever and strong, they have another weapon. Their patience. They can go for months without eating, but after a fast like that, any prey passing within range of their massive jaws would have to be very lucky to escape. Armed with about 70 teeth, a thick body armor of scales, and powerful appendages that they can use to leap their full body length, their attacks are furious and frightening. Body submerged to surface level in a river or a pond makes them almost undetectable, just a part of the environment, until they surprise their victim. Buffalo, zebras, antelope, these are perfect prey, and slippery shoreline mud or steep riverbanks often make it hard for the prey to get away. A female crocodile decides to go after a young zebra that has been separated from the main group in the middle of the flowing water. It's not a fair fight. Alone, terrified and wounded in the river, the animal doesn't know where to go or how to get away. The female crocodile tries to drag the wounded creature down into the water, but the youngster is resisting ferociously. It's hopeless. The crocodile has to have a better hold. The prey might get away. Whatever it takes, she has to get a firmer grip with her jaws, and in those few seconds, the zebra could get away. Suddenly, the vice is loosened. 
Instantly, the zebra takes advantage and breaks away, desperately climbing up the riverbank. Exhausted by the violent struggle to stay alive, the young zebra has to rest. But lions are always prowling along the river, seeking new prey. The young zebra's minutes are numbered, because she is wounded. And in the savannah, a wounded animal is as good as dead. Here at the river, the lions have this prey for the taking. In fact, they have a wide choice of animals that are fatigued from crossing the river, or sick, or wounded. The ones that trail behind the herd. As for the crocodiles, they gather around the only crossing point for the animals. A zebra sounds an alarm to warn the others. But the crocodiles are well aware they know all they have to do is lie in the water and wait. Sooner or later, the next grazing animals will give in to the strong temptation to cross. It might be Thompson gazelles eager to find that greener grass on the other side. For them, crossing the river is a real adventure. They're too small to resist the current. They wait, hesitating to take the first step. But for all their fear and reticence, the lure of the wonders sure to be found on the other side becomes too strong. The ones motivated by frantic urges to migrate often pay for their audacity with their lives. Sharing meals is a well-established tradition among crocodiles. A female comes to the party, but uh, the prey isn't big enough for two. You don't share a gazelle. Resigned to this, the guest has only to reach the riverbank and participate in a crocodile's favorite pastime, the siesta. But during the mass migration across the Masimara Plains, danger comes not only from crossing the river, it lurks everywhere. A well-organized pack of wild dogs attacks a young Ganu. It's encircled and separated from the herd. The predators then go at it fiercely, relentlessly, showing no mercy. The Ganu is exhausted. It's time for the kill. At one point, the animal nearly falls to the ground. One of the wild dogs seizes a hoof. And finally, the creature drops. Often, the attackers will hold the muffle of the prey tight until it stops all movement. Now it just remains for the predators to share the meal. Back at the lair, a part of the meal will be regurgitated by the mothers to feed their young. It may seem that predators are ruthless, they show no mercy at all. But they kill only when they're hungry. Their potential prey senses this. As we saw, herds are often oblivious to lions walking almost beside them. But if a herd senses that a lion is hungry, they are away and fast. Yes, usually lions hunt in groups, or rather the lionesses hunt in groups. Males take no part in the hunting. They are content to feast on what the females bring in. What lions like most are gnus and zebras, the slower animals that are easier to run down, not the gazelles and antelope. Actually, hunting any animal is always difficult. When hunting in groups, lionesses lie in wait, upwind, but one is stationed downwind. They wait for the right moment, and then come out all at once, heading straight for the herd. The targeted animal 
is, of course, terrified and runs in all directions. There's every chance that the ambush will be successful. It is said that the zebra has an anti-lion camouflage. When they're running fast and trying to get away from the lions, their stripes create an optical effect that makes it difficult for a lion to distinguish where one zebra starts and the other ends. Unfortunately for the zebras, the effect isn't very effective. A lioness kills by strangulation and it's a slow death. The victim tries to get breath. It might take 10 minutes before the animal dies. The success score for females that hunt alone is fairly low. It's about 17%, one kill in every five attempts. This makes the survival of the lion cubs fairly uncertain. It's not surprising that they prefer hunting in groups. Today, the lionesses and the cubs are eating as fast as they can before a male comes along to take his share. When a male is present, he is always served first. But this time, mom and the kids will have full stomachs. All the same, the odor of the carcass draws famished hyenas. The banquet attracts envious neighbors. The hyena moves in closer, no doubt convinced that the moment has come to make his move. But the lionesses have no intention of letting him get away with it. He's going to have to wait until the lion family has had its fill, and then he will move in to find they have left him a few bare bones. No, not much chance that the lions will leave much for the hyena. Well, if there's nothing here, the hyena has to resume a solitary quest. Why not seek out tender prey, fresh meat, for instance, an unsuspecting, defenseless baby cheetah? For out in the wild, hostile nature, the lives of the young, whether predator or prey, are often precarious. However, the hyena just might have a difficult and dangerous fight with the mother. Intimidation, dissuasion, will he dare? No, the risk looks too great. The hyena goes on his way and keeps on the prowl for other prey. His courage seems to have deserted him for trying another attack. Off the hyena goes looking for any food to quell the pangs of hunger. Once the danger is over, the mother cheetah is required to leave her little ones and go off to hunt. But will they be there when she returns? In the savannah, cruel choices have to be made. The hyena appears to have gone off and is now far enough away. The cheetah has to go for it. A quick hunt and then back to the lair. The hyena is watching all this. And a little too sure of itself approaches the cheetah, certain to come out the winner. But just then, a new character walks on stage, one that was not expected, a lioness. This one is really sure of herself and determined to turn the situation to her advantage. Nobody dares attack her. The hyena and the cheetah are left on their own. Indifferent, the lioness ignores them with the arrogance of a victor.
vexed, the hyena, again, goes off to a safe distance. Out of breath, the cheetah isn't too sure that she'll have a meal today. She'd better just go back to her little ones, or maybe make one last attempt under the watchful gaze of the hyena, who more than ever is looking for his slightest chance. By now, other hyenas are present, curious to see how well the cheetah will do. With energy born of hopelessness, the cheetah begins a frantic chase in pursuit of a gnu, but she lacks conviction and is too soon out of breath. Even the gallery of watching hyenas doesn't think that she'll succeed. However, they join others of their pack and profit from the panic caused by the cheetah to attack a wounded gnu. The lone hyena would very much like to join the party. Well, aren't there cordial relations among all members of the same species? No cordial relations at all. A very strict social order determines relationships among individuals and groups of hyenas. The loner is not part of this group, so the dominant female directing the group chases him away in no uncertain terms. Nothing can be done, so it's best just to melt away into the distance. The dry season is drawing to a close, and carnivorous animals are finding less and less game, and they're growing weaker. The hyena has been walking for a week, looking for food, doing anything to blot out the terrible pangs of hunger. He has just about enough strength to stand up and return to his lair. Oh, he knows the vultures are waiting for just one thing, for him to lie down and not get up. But hyenas belong to a species with incredible resistance. Gathering up all his strength, he sets off on his quest. He isn't lucky and doesn't have the strength of a lion, but all the same, his plight isn't so bad compared to that of the warthog that the lioness has no hesitation in devouring while still alive. The hyena was right to wait around for a while. At last, there is a reward because the lioness leaves the warthog carcass after eating only the entrails. Finally, something to eat. Even among lions, survival isn't always so easy, at least not for the cubs. They may be the offspring of the animal king, but their future is often compromised. Power and strength characterize the lion, but the cubs are vulnerable, and danger lurks everywhere, even within their own group. Actually, among the lions, everybody seems to be getting along with a certain intelligence. The females, within a family, are taking good care of the little ones. A female will submit to any sort of nuisance from the cubs, and will even take care of the ones that are not her own. So the females remain calm, but it's quite different with the males. They guarantee reproduction, and they protect the females and the cubs, but they can turn dangerous for the cubs. Unmindful of his tremendous strength, a male who is annoyed by a cub, teasing him, just might kill the youngster with a swipe of his paw. Lions like to live in a stable family group, and yet the young ones, especially the newborn, 
are always vulnerable. Prudently, a female about to give birth distances herself from the group and finds a lair where she can have her cubs. She wants to find a natural hiding place where hyenas and jackals and cheetahs can't get at the little ones, and to keep them safe from the male lions that might come to take them. A female may have as many as six cubs at a time, but only one in five will survive to adulthood. Cubs are most fragile during the first 20 months. Then they are young adults. The mother lioness has to leave her cubs in the hiding place and go out to forage for food, but she never knows whether when she returns she's going to find them dead or alive. Will they escape the prowling predators? The lioness is now isolated from her group, and she has to hunt alone. Her predatory hunting instincts have to overcome her maternal feelings. She must go off to hunt even though solitary male lions are prowling the area. They pose an enormous danger for the newborn cubs. If a male lion discovers them, he will probably kill them at once. Time is of the essence. The female must get back as quickly as possible. A lion alerted by the noises emerges from a thicket. A male lion does very little in life. He sleeps and takes care of reproduction, protects the group, and eats to his fill whatever the lionesses bring in from the hunt. And usually he's first in line. The lioness is well advised to catch her breath quickly and start eating as much as she can to regain her strength before the male shows up. Five kilograms, ten pounds of meat every day, that's what every male or female lion requires for survival. But one might eat up to 35 kilograms, 70 pounds, at a single meal. The effort has been so strenuous, the lioness has to recuperate for a good ten minutes before feeling strong enough to begin eating. Mm -hmm. Drawn to the food, the male approaches the female. She submits because she knows the social order within lion groups. Males take first. Hence, the lion's share, and here it literally means that he takes all the best pieces for himself and he takes them before anyone else in the group. A male lion can be the most powerful predator of the savanna if he chooses. He's fearless. No animal would ever approach his killed prey. The lioness can only wait, resigned to the situation, and go off to her cubs. Returning from the hunt, the young mother lioness has to make her presence known. A cruel surprise awaits her. Her little ones had a surprise visit from a solitary male lion that happened upon them. Only one cub remains, but it's dead. She takes it and wanders through the savanna for a long time. before she can bring herself to give up the cub's body to the vultures. Accused of killing for pleasure, predators have incurred a bad reputation, and yet, for over half a century, many scientific studies have proven their usefulness. A number of predators are key species that enrich their region and determine the structure of animal communities. They maintain a good balance between various species. Attempting to suppress the predators to protect nature 
is a mistake because any place without predators is not a stable environment. On the contrary, it's an artificial habitat made poorer and more fragile. Following an implacable and ferocious law, by attacking the most vulnerable individuals, predators remove weak and sick animals from nature to the benefit of the stronger animals. For all that, the life of a predator is not so simple. Nature's implacable law applies to them, too. A sick predator, one that is wounded or not very good at the art of hunting, will in turn disappear. Learning to be a good hunter requires a long period of instruction. For example, a female cheetah has to take great pains teaching her young to hunt, so they learn to recognize and stalk down their future prey. They have to be taught how to choose prey, sense all its reactions, and know how to get it. Most important, young cheetahs have to master the essential swipe of the paw that knocks running prey to the ground. As a rule, the cheetah is certainly a superb sprinter, but since they can't take the quick turns at high speed while running, they have to rely on striking their prey precisely and forcefully with one paw, throwing it off balance and dropping it to the ground. The students learn this by practicing on a young live antelope provided by their mother. In the broadest sense, being a predator is feeding on other living creatures. Under that definition, practically all animals are predators. It's just a matter of scale. In the savanna, baboons are, for the most part, omnivorous. But sometimes they reveal themselves as accomplished predators. The males have no hesitation in attacking other mammals that they may encounter on their way. They can be terrifying opponents. Their bite is awesome. A powerful dominant male has caught a small gazelle. He doesn't wait for the prey to die before devouring it. Right in front of his underlings. This male may leave a few scraps for others, but only after he's had his fill. In the savanna, death is a part of everyday life. The baboons set off for new horizons. But predators are not limited to attacking weak herbivores. They devour other predators, and at every opportunity. Some animals are completely oblivious to the danger present along the riverbanks. Like young baboons, apparently, the smaller the predator, the more invulnerable they feel. Foolhardy or oblivious, the baboons have apparently decided to tempt the devil, and this particular devil is a crocodile. For the young ones, the game is approaching the riverbank as close as possible, but for the older ones, the most exciting provocation is in actually drinking from the river very close to a crocodile who's pretending to be asleep. It would seem that the one taking the greatest risk is matching himself against the most dangerous predator of the river. A youngster takes one chance too many and things get dramatic. 
The alert is sounded, but it's too late. The entire group looks on helpless, seeing the young baboon in the jaws of the hungry crocodile. In the world of the predator, you pay for the slightest mistake. But along the river banks, the crocodiles don't always have it their way. Facing a hippopotamus, the law of the stronger and the bigger holds, and the hippos move right in to use their heavyweight position to provoke the crocodiles. The hippos and the crocs live together in the river. The crocodiles may present no direct threat to the hippos, but all the same, they might go for a young defenseless crocodile. Defending territory, provoking, hippos are quick to show disdain for the crocodiles as soon as they're big enough to intimidate them. And in response, the crocodiles feign indifference. Even the youngest get in the game. On dry land, the adult crocodiles do their best to frighten the hippos. They multiply their efforts, but the massive creatures don't believe a word of it, so to speak. If duels between adults held on land seem not really dangerous for the combatants, it's not the same in the river, when the crocodiles are again in their preferred hunting ground. In the aquatic element, a crocodile is ruthless facing a young hippo didn't realize how dangerous it is to get separated from the group. Cunningly, the crocodile approaches slowly. Very calmly, it pursues the prey, waiting for the right moment to strike. Feeling safe, not sensing exposure to any danger, the hippo swims down in the water. And the crocodile glides effortlessly. He's in no hurry. In this unequal pursuit, the two animals rise to the surface. It only remains for the crocodile to pounce and pay no penalty. The only place to satisfy a thirst is in the river, and that's where every danger lurks. But nature isn't fair. Some risk everything. Others face virtually no danger. Take the giraffe, gaining considerable protection from its great height. Still, it's in mortal danger drinking at the river because it has to spread its legs, and in this uncomfortable position, the giraffe is highly vulnerable. If there's no shortage of game here, it's because every year the migration cycle of the herbivores of Serengeti conducts one and a half million gnus and countless other animals across the Masai Mara Plateau to Kenya to spend the summer. Water holes and the whole environment provide predators with a happy hunting ground, and these meat eaters take full advantage. Nevertheless, the actual hunting is far from assured. As always, some succeed and others fail, but it's not because there's no game. 
Some prey defend themselves with enough energy to repulse the most ferocious attacks. With four against one, the cheetahs seem to have achieved their goal. But such combats don't always end as predicted. It would appear that the cheetahs have the advantage, but that doesn't take into account the endurance of their opponent or the canoe's instinct for survival. Despite the ferocious attack he has endured, will the canoe's stubborn refusal to give in result in his eluding his attackers? Thrown off balance by the canoe's sustained fury in managing to escape their claws and teeth, the cheetahs seem unable to administer the fatal blow. Suddenly, in an astounding burst of energy, against all odds, the canoe does manage to escape from all those predators. Totally exhausted by all this, the cheetahs give up. In this immense jumble of thousands of canoes and zebras and gazelles, as we have seen, the most fearful moments of their long migration trek come when they have to cross the river. But paradoxically, if it's their great number that attracts predators, it's also their massive numbers that provide their best defense against the feared crocodiles. The gnus throw themselves into the river where the crocodiles await them to conduct them to their doom. But there is such a density, so many animals churning in all directions. In this confusion of horns and hooves, the crocodiles are confused, unable to find a precise target. Some of them even stomp on crocodile heads in their frantic, panicky movements. This superabundant flow of animals disorients the predators, but any animals that stray from the central melee, any out on their own, are instantly victims of ferocious crocodile attacks. The prey is seized in a single leap, the victim rendered rigid by the pain of the bite held firmly in those massive jaws and the crocodile begin to devour the animal. Often several others quickly come to share the feast, unless the first crocodile can manage to plunge the prize to the bottom of the river. If there were not predators on the great plains of the African savanna, it would create a major imbalance in the proper development of the ecosystem. Nature creates a balance where each animal has its place in the food chain. All species reproduce and evolve according to a cycle that allows them to live together in the same territory. Without predators, some species would overdevelop to the detriment of others, possibly resulting in the extinction of species.